Saving America, one entrepreneur at a time. It's the Biz Rap Podcast with your host, Michael Manahan. The show that celebrates small business and entrepreneurs, it's Biz Rap Radio with your host, small businessman, educator, and author, Michael Manahan. And welcome to another edition of Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan, and thank you so much for joining me today. We've got a great show lined up for you. If you're new to BizRap Radio, we are the show all about small business and entrepreneurs. Yes, we are the show that is about the drivers of the United States economy. And maybe you didn't know that, but as we pull out of the recession, most of the new jobs are created by small businesses. Most people in America work for small businesses. Yet what happens when uh, we have uh, uh, an economic meltdown? Well, the government's bailing out the fat cats on Wall Street and the big corporations and letting all of the small business people just die on the vine. Yes, there's a war going on in this country. No, it's not the war on poverty. It's not the war on women. It is the war on small business. The government's out to get you ever-increasing regulations, making it more difficult for you to uh, make money. And then when you do make money, the government wanting an ever-increasing share of that pie. Uh, the big businesses want to put you out of business so they can corral the marketplace. And, of course, the banks, well, when was the last time you heard of a small business getting a bank loan? Yeah, if you've got a you know, 10-year track record of profits and you want to put up your house. But when was the last time somebody said, I want to start a business, I'm just going to go into my local banker here and get a fifty or $100,000 loan to start your business? No, but they'll be happy to give you a credit card and jack your rates up to 27% like American Express did to somebody that I know who missed one payment, got a $50,000 thousand dollar balance on the american express card one payment missed whammo 27 percent that used to be i thought that there was the there was laws against we used to call it usury <laughs> and and you'd go to jail for charging interest rates like that but that's what the banks are doing yeah they're happy to give you a credit card to finance your business charge you outrageous interest rates while your money on deposit is you're earning a fraction of a percent in interest and then um we wonder why this country's in trouble. But that's okay. Small business to the rescue. We are a nation of entrepreneurs. We're a nation of small business people. And you owe it to our society to be a small business person, be an entrepreneur. You need to make a profit. Hey, profit's not a dirty word. That's why you're in business. Yeah, I know it's got a, rap, a bad rap from people. But, you know, it, it just, we're not all altruists. you got to go out there, you make a profit. And you make a profit for a reason. You reinvest it in your business. You take care of your family. You take care of your employees. You take care of your community. Yeah, no, uh, for some reason we got this all screwed up. Now it seems to be people think you make a profit, you write a big fat check to Uncle Sam in Washington, and Uncle Sam solves all of the problems. Well, just take a look over the last 30 years. What problems has Uncle Sam actually solved? Seems to me they've created far more than they've solved. That's okay, though. you got to pay your taxes, uh, but it, it, maybe there's a way to pay less of those taxes. And I've got a guest on the line today who might be able to help us with that. It is Robert Sly. He is a wealth advisor. He lives in Columbus, Ohio, and he specializes in developing tax-free and risk-free wealth in your personal and business finances. And I'm not sure what all that means, so we're going to we're going to ask Robert that very question. Robert, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate being there. You, you know, I hear this term tossed around: wealth management. Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, terms like this often confuse me. What is exact? What does exactly that mean? Wealth management. Really, what we do is just give you options, and we educate you so that you know what the options are. Our belief is that you should be the best steward of your money as opposed to handing it to somebody and hoping they do a good job for you while, by the way, charging you between 3 and 5% uh, of anything that you make. Well, here's... So we believe get, yeah, giving it back into the, into the hands of the people that make it just makes the, the most sense. 
Yeah, you know, and and, and I don't know what it is about that word wealth, but all of a sudden I think of some, you know, somebody, I live in Los Angeles, Long Beach, California, actually, but, you know, we're close to Los Angeles, and I think of somebody living up in the Hollywood Hills, some uh, executive producer of some television show, he's raking in $5 million a year, he's got a, you know, a $10 million, $15 million house up in the hills. Um, is, is, Is that what you're talking about, or is this something that's applicable? for the small businessman who saved and scrimped and he's managed to put away three or four or five hundred thousand dollars well I firmly believe that wealth is a matter of heart there's there's rich and there's poor and, and and rich is a matter of money but wealth is truly a matter of heart and what you can do with that money so three four five hundred thousand dollars in the hands of somebody that has a great heart for it and can truly take care of their family and others and, and be generous in our, on every occasion, that to me is true wealth. And do we all want to make four, five, six million dollars a year? Absolutely. Because you can do so many great things and make such a greater impact. Uh, out in the world with it. Uh, one of the complaints I hear from entrepreneurs all the time is an entrepreneur says, you know something, uh, I didn't make it overnight. Uh, I started this business 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. We struggled for many years. There was many years I took very little pay out of the company, just enough to put food on the table for my family. We've tried every strategy under the book, and for whatever reason, we've managed to stick in there. The business has grown, and finally, after you know, 15 years in the trenches uh, working 12 hours a day as in seven days a week and ignoring my family and what have you, I finally made it and I'm starting to make some real money. I'm making now, you know, I'm making three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. And guess what? Now that I'm successful, Uncle Sam is coming along and snapping up 40 percent of that money. Uh, and here, if you're in the state of California, the state of California wants another 11 uh, percent. It it uh, what can, it just doesn't seem fair. First of all, that somebody who's put in that much effort while their buddies and associates were out in corporate jobs making 150 thousand a year, they're making 45 thousand a year and just getting by. Now all of a sudden they hit the jackpot. Uh, their their work has paid off. And uh, and now everybody wants to grab their money. So what can somebody like that do to reduce the burden of taxes that our government puts on the successful successful small business person? Well, one of the biggest things that, that we have struggles with as, as a business owner, and, and I am a small business owner uh, like you, like yourself, like the people on the on this uh, channel here. And one of the main challenges that we face is really how to convert our equity in our business because. That's what we really want to do. We we started this, you know, started a business to be able to make money and to make good money and take care of our families in a great way. So we, we want to take take that equity in our business as our business grows and get it out of our business so that it can grow in a in a separate um, account or fund, as it were, and actually produce wealth for us so that we can access that money. But many of us don't know how to do that. And once we do do, you know, once we are able to do that, we really, like you said, we get hit with 40% taxes. One of the things that we do is we have, we have products and tools, and there are so many tools out there to, to produce wealth, to safeguard wealth, to really, you know, make it work for you. But most people don't know about the ones that can truly be accessed tax-free. That's one of the things that we specialize in because, you know, while even the Bible says pay Caesar what is Caesar's, I don't think you should pay him anything more than you truly have to. Uh, pay what you have to, but then as far as your retirement and, and building a wealth fund for your, uh, for your family, you, need to, be, you need, need to be able to access that money tax-free and also pass it tax-free. We specialize in tools that do exactly that. Well, that's great news. Now, something I'm always talking to entrepreneurs about is the fact that you've got to take some money off the table. I know so many entrepreneurs that run businesses and everything they've got is tied up 
in that business. Maybe they have a nice house, yes, and a car, but everything else is tied up in the business. And I urge entrepreneurs, you've got to take some off the table, take it out of the business, and store it somewhere else where it not only accumulates wealth for you, but also where it's protected from all of the vultures that can come after your business between the government, uh, the frivolous lawsuits from the vulture attorneys who are out there. I mean, I've heard of so many businesses just totally wiped out from a, just a, you know, a simple contravention of a of of some minor statute, and the first thing they've got is they've got some lawyers rattling their chains and uh, threatening lawsuits and. And, of course, then you call a lawyer to defend yourself, and all of a sudden every dollar of your profits, it's not going into your pocket. It's going into uh, some attorney's pocket. So um, I can definitely understand that. Hey, look, it, we are 30 seconds away from break. Uh, Robert, quickly, how can somebody get a hold of you if they're interested in your services to help them uh, save uh, their money and, and create wealth? My phone number is area code 614-260-6619. My email account is we are wealth smart w e a r e w e a l t h s m a r t a r t at gmail dot com. Okay, fantastic. Your host Mike Manahan on with uh, Robert Sly, and we'll be back right after these messages. And welcome back to BizRap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan, and thanks so much for sticking with us. If you just joined us, we are speaking with Robert Sly. Robert Sly is a wealth manager, and he's got a whole bunch of ideas and strategies as to how you can better manage your wealth. Now, of course, a lot of our listeners are entrepreneurs and small business people. Some of you are still struggling. You're still trying to launch your enterprise. But I know there's listeners out there who are reaching that stage where it's time to start harvesting. You've worked many, many years. You put in a lot of sweat, time, effort, worry. You've taken risk, and finally you've made some money. You deserve it. Be proud of yourself, but get some of it off the table. Uh, Get some of it out of your business. Start accumulating wealth outside the business, and maybe Robert can give you some ideas on how to do that. Robert, uh, thanks again for being on the show. Absolutely, sir. I appreciate you having me. So you've got some thoughts and ideas about uh, businesses, and, and let's k- kind of go over these. Uh, you mentioned that there's three characteristics of business equity. What, what are those three characteristics? Three characteristics are bas- basically one is the fact that business equity is normally illiquid or, or not liquid. Uh, it's very hard and, and sometimes expensive to convert, convert into cash. And, uh, you know, our whole goal is should be to reduce our business uh, our biz, business liquidity risk over time, not not to concentrate it. So one of the other things is is it, it's exposed to risk. Uh, the economy in general, industry events, capital markets, uh, labor resources, technology changes, you name it, all of those things can really be a risk to our business. And the other, the third thing would be exposure to taxes. Now, fortunately, business equity isn't exposed to taxes until we convert it into cash. But unfortunately, we have no idea what our future tax exposure is going to be because anybody that thinks the taxes are going uh, down uh, in the near future, I I think, is probably a little misled there. Well, that 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 that's absolutely correct. I mean, the 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 only way our government is going to pay its bills is if it collects more taxes. And uh, I, I often listen to the government, by the way, representatives, and they'll say, "Well, we we haven't increased taxes, but." Uh, They've increased what I call quasi-taxes, which are uh, fines, penalties, or alternatively, and this is a problem with people that own their own business, uh, if you have to pay for something that somebody down the street gets for free, then technically that is a tax on you. So when you say uh, whatever the tax rate is, the tax rates really aren't accurate because they don't reflect all of the stuff you have to pay for that somebody else gets for free. Now, you go to, as an example, uh, in certain countries, Germany, for example, education is free. Everybody gets it. 
But here in the United States, education is free for some people, but other people have to pay for it. So technically, the people who have to pay for their education and don't get it for free are paying a tax that somebody else does not uh, have to pay. And so when you start to add it up, I mean, the taxes we pay in this country are absolutely outrageous. And then, of course, there's the little trick the government has is there's this thing called the payroll tax. Uh, used to be, by the way, your social, the company would make a contribution to to Medicare on your behalf and a contribution to Social Security on your behalf. Well, they stopped calling that uh, Medicare and Social Security contributions by the company, by your employer, a long time ago, and they just now call it a payroll tax. And those payroll taxes keep going up, so your tax may not be going up, but the tax that the company is paying on your behalf certainly is going up. So what, what can we do? What, what are some of the strategies we should be, uh, now that we understand these uh, three characteristics of business equity, what are some strategies we should be using to protect that business equity? Well, uh, one of my key partners and CEO of my company is a gentleman by the name of James Beatty, and he goes by the, by the name Jay. He's author of a best-selling book called Rigged, Unlearning Mainstream Propaganda and Building Your Personal Fortune. And it's, it's a fantastic book that really kind of outlines the fact that Wall Street has done a fantastic job of separating us from our money, whether we're a business owner or whether we're an employee and just trying trying to figure something out for for retirement. And they have uh, they've really gone to great lengths to uh, make sure that we don't control a lot of that. But what, what's what's cool about the business owner is that the net the, the there was a research done that the net worth in this country is 362% greater for small business owners uh, that's 100 employees or less, a total of $5.7 trillion in small business equity than to the regular employee. The unfortunate part is that 65 to 95% of that personal net worth is tied up in business, and you know, which is far greater than the general population um, has their money tied up. So you really have two options in order to separate your equity from your from your business and to get into into some accounts that uh, can do some great things for you one of those options is the to sell or you know merge your business monetize it in some way the unfortunate thing is is that over the next 15 years 43% of businesses are owned by baby boomers so they're looking to start selling those businesses and it's, you know, 60% of those are looking to do that. And this is put out by the Small Businesses Association of the U.S. So 7.2 million businesses are looking to sell over the next 15 years. That's 478,000 businesses per year over the next 20 years that are looking to sell compared to 8,000 over the previous five. Wow, that, that is absolutely incredible. I never thought about that, but you're right. All these baby boomers who own these businesses, they're looking for an exit strategy. Well, there's an opportunity for somebody who's got the resources, but also does that mean because of the number of businesses that are going to be on the market that the price that you're going to get for your business might not be as good as what you say you could get for it uh, you know, uh, five years ago or ten years ago? Well, that's exactly it. It's it's absolute buyer's market, and not only is it going to drive price down, but it's also going to drive your timing. All cattywampus. It's you know when you think you're going to be able to do this it may change because there's just so many businesses out there trying to sell, and not enough buyers. So, so that means that a business owner really has to be developing a strategy to. Uh, get themselves out of their business, and it's interesting because I, I'm, you know, I, in addition to doing the radio show, I do uh, business consulting. Uh, I have a client I'm working with right now, uh, older woman, very successful in her business, uh, and uh, she has absolutely no exit strategy for how she's going to get herself out of this business. Uh, at some point in time. And and when I say older, I mean, this lady is uh, probably in her early 70s with absolutely no exit strategy, no idea who's going to buy the business, if she's going to sell it, if she's going to shut it down, oh, wow. what she's going to do with it. So she it sounds like she should be talking to you, Robert. Well, absolutely. Uh, uh, CPA firm, 
firm by the name of Grant Thornton uh, made a quote, and it, it was pretty interesting. They said 90% of business owners, owners have an exit dream, but not an exit strategy. <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, so if, what, I'm just going to say, listen, if you're listening to us, if you're listening to this show, if you own a business and you don't have a pretty clear-cut idea of when and how you're going to get out, you need to start thinking about that right now. And one option might be to contact Robert. Uh, uh, Robert, what's your contact information again if somebody wants to uh, get hold of you? You bet. My phone number is 614-260-6619. And my email is W-E-A-R-E. W E A L T H S M A R T. So we are wealth smart at gmail.com. Now, you're in Columbus, Ohio. What if, uh, what if uh, say, somebody listening to me here in California gives you a call? Can you still help them all the way from uh, Columbus? Absolutely. I have, uh, I have the ability to help people in all 50 states and certainly willing to do that. We have, uh, you know, this is the age of technology. So you have webinars, you have all sorts of different things that we can actually meet face to face from thousands of miles away. Well, and probably just thinking realistically, uh, living in Columbus, Ohio, your cost of living is probably a lot less than, say, Beverly Hills, California. So as a consequence, <laughs> your, your rates might be just a little more reasonable than some of those uh, fat cats up on Rodeo Drive would want to charge. Well, absolutely. And, and I'm going to discuss a little something later on called something called fee neutral. And you're going to be excited to hear what that, what that definition is. Okay, so uh, we, we've talked about um, uh, the, that these baby boomers going to be coming up and wanting to sell their business. Uh, you know, I'm looking here at the time. We we're about 30 seconds away from commercial. Uh, so uh, very quickly, what, what should somebody who owns a business right now really be doing? Well, they need to be seeing how they can get their money out of that business. Uh, one of the other things is cash flow, and we'll talk about that after the break. Uh, as far as cash flow distributions and how those can be structured in such a way that it will keep the tax men out of their pocket and and really guarantee a uh, no-risk way to build wealth for their family. Okay, well, let's talk about that more after the break. It's Michael Manahan, BizRap Radio, uh, on the line with Robert Sly, Wealth Manager. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan, and thank you so much for joining us today and sticking with us through the show. If you just joined us, we're talking about wealth management. And we have on the line with us Robert Sly. He is a wealth manager. He has a number of strategies how you can uh, enhance your wealth, protect your wealth as small business people and entrepreneurs. Hopefully you're making money. Hopefully some of you out there are, are uh, looking at, uh, at wanting to build on what you have already created. You maybe want to take and monetize some of the equity you have in your business. We talked a little bit about how... Um, uh, the characteristics of business equity and how that business equity can kind of get trapped in your business. And we also talked about the fact that uh, with the baby boomers coming on retirement, there is going to be a prol proliferation of businesses for sale, which potentially could make it a buyer's market. That means it's going to be tougher to get that price you want for your business. So you really do need to be thinking about exit strategy. Robert, thank you so much for sticking with us. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. Now, you, uh, you talk about something called wealth killers. What exactly do you mean by wealth killers? Well, the three, there are three wealth killers. They are market risk, they are taxes, and they are fees and commissions. And most people feel that they, in order to build any kind of substantial wealth, they think, think of your wealth building as, as a balloon. You know, Wall Street does a great job of, of showing you that really big, pretty, bright balloon that, you know, in the form of big returns, right? You can get 30% here and, yay, that's cool. But what they don't show you are the three sandbags that hold that balloon down. If you've ever looked at a hot air balloon and how that goes up and that counterbalance, what keeps that balloon on the ground are sandbags. And I'm going to call those sandbags the same thing as the three wealth killers. They're market risks, they're taxes, and they're fees and commissions. And if you look at a uh, fee and commission schedule over a 30-year period, 
you're thinking, oh, my, my broker only charges me, you know, say 1%. Well, that 1% over a 30-year period is truly about 28% of the wealth that you've accumulated in opportunity cost. Because working with, with compound interest and, and, you know, Einstein's rule of 72, that negative impact will continue to compound as well. So it's actually about 28%. Wow, that's amazing. And, absolutely. And then we, then we start talking about taxes. And, and here's the funny thing about taxes. If you, you know, think about borrowing money from somebody and they tell you, okay, that's great. You can pay me back, you know, 30 years down the road. I'll let you know what the rate is when we get there. Because <laughs> that's what Uncle Sam is doing. Right. We, don't know, we don't know what the tax rate's going to be 30 years from now. But he's going to let us know. And no matter what, if we're in a 401k or 403b, any of those qualified plans, we're going to end up, paying uh, taxes on that money regardless because we have to pull it out at the age of 70, 70 and a half. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mandatory distribution. So all that money that we start putting away, and that's, that's one of the, the cash flow things that you can do with your business to, to separate equity, is using a qualified plan. But unfortunately, they're, they tend to be high cost. Again, the tax applications, like I just mentioned, and there, and there's also market risk, that third wealth killer. Anybody that went through 2008 knows that that market risk just kills you. And the coolest joke is on those people closest to retirement. They're 62, 63 years old. They're getting ready to retire. Suddenly 2008 happens, or 2015, as, as a lot of people predict, may happen. Um, then what are they going to do? Then they have, they have little or no time to gain that 30, 40% hit back on their money. And it really puts them, you know, that's why you walk into a Walmart and see grandma and grandpa standing there at 70, 80 years old going, welcome to Walmart. Well, but thank you for Walmart for uh, for employing those people. I have to at least give them <laughs> right. credit for that. Uh, in spite of the fact Walmart seems to be one of the favorite whipping boys in our country. I'll tell you something. Uh, Walmart has done more for the poor people in this country than any government program in terms of their ability to deliver products and to our uh, to the people of the at the lower well, not just at the lower economic uh, stratum but everybody in the United States you know what I, I if I was the military I would give Walmart the job of managing logistics I'll bet you we could cut we could cut a hundred billion dollars out of that military budget in the snap of the fingers <laughs> oh absolutely I agree and they, they've done some great things and they started out of, you know everybody kind of downs like you said on Walmart but they started out that small business and they were just a business success story, and they have put a lot of people to work. And that's a big thing, too, is small business owners and, and even the big ones, those are the people providing jobs in this country. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you can, you can down them all you want, but the fact is that you wouldn't have a job if it wasn't for them. Well, okay, so let's continue to talk about that. Now, one of my concerns with somebody who uses the term wealth management, uh, and I've, I've, I've met lots of people you know, over the years in my career who, who all have some strategy for taking care of other people's money. And, and what I find is uh, there, there seems to be what I would call a formulaic approach. Like I know one guy... His answer for everything is some manner of insurance product. I mean, you could say to him, uh, you know, uh, 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 gosh, I want to go on vacation next year. He'd say, well, I've got an insurance product that can figure that out for you. And I know another guy. His whole shtick is everything should be in some – he's got these creative real estate deals that he does where you get these quadruple net things, and uh, and it's all about real estate. And then i got another associate of mine. No, no, no. You've got to be a balanced portfolio of, 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 uh, you know, of indexed mutual funds. That's exactly where it is. And it, it seems everybody who's trying to look after – other people's money kind of has – they really don't do much analysis or, 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 or what have you. They just say, well, give me your money, and I will put it into my program. Uh, how do you approach that? Do you just have a specific program, or do you actually take a look and, and, and figure out really what the clients are looking for and what they're trying to accomplish? Well, you actually – you really have to. Uh, our favorite thing is, is taking the pieces of the financial puzzle, throwing them on the table, and going, okay – how does this make the kind of picture that they want? 
what kind of goals are they looking for uh, to accomplish, and how are we going to get them there? And there is no cookie cutter approach ever to uh, to doing this, because some people have you know you walk into one business and they've got massive consumer debt. You walk into another household and they have you know school loans, or they have or or they haven't even started saving for retirement. That's a huge. Uh, deal there as well. The average 401k holds about thirty thousand dollars in this country at at retirement. Wow. And I and I don't know about you, but I I don't think I could live on thirty thousand dollars for a twenty year span of retirement, let alone one year. No, I've <laughs> I've, I've got my strategy all set. What I'm going to do is because I'm I'm just turning sixty. I'm going to start hanging out at the bar up at the Beverly Regent or the Beverly Wilshire Hotel, and I'm going to pick up <laughs> one of those uh, old widows, you know, like uh, the one with the Hollywood money, and you know, that it seems to me that's a great way to retire. Well, absolutely, and, and if you're able to do that, I don't know if there's any really, really ritzy bars here in Columbus, Ohio, for me to do that at. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, we also we also need to look at when we look at money, we need to look at the five money needs, and it's really a blueprint for for building your wealth. And those five money needs are, are real simple: they're safety, growth, income, liquidity, and tax efficiency. And if you measure everything that you look at for as far as an investment strategy and, and you know, the mutual fund com- guy come to see you or the insurance guy or the or the uh, you know the Wall Street broker, measure those five things again against it. Is is my money gonna be safe? Because you know, I'm I'm not quite up where you're at. I'm forty seven. But at the age of forty seven, I can't afford to lose any money. So I look at I look at a safety factor. Uh, I also look look at growth. A lot of people think that in order to be completely safe, you have to take one and two percent um, growth. You know, and and there there are several tools out there that that just make this simply not true, and and we employ several of them, and, and it's kind of nice to see, you know, over the last twenty five years, this anywhere from a seven to nine percent growth rate that is really competing with anybody out there, and yet not losing any money. Okay, Robert, look at, get quickly, give your information. This is, uh, we're going to wrap it up here in about 30 seconds, but I want people to know, how can they get a hold of you? Uh, my phone number is 614-260-6619, and my email is wearewealthsmart at gmail.com, W-E-A-R-E-W-E-A-L-T-H-S-M-A-R-T, We Are Wealth Smart, and my company is Wealth Smart America. Okay, fantastic. And it is Robert Sly, Wealth Smart America. If you have a business and you need to start looking out for your assets and figuring out how you what your exit strategy is, how you take some of that money off the table and you start creating wealth, you need to talk to Robert. Give him a call. It is Mike Manahan, your host, BizRap Radio. Thank you for listening. We'll be back right after these messages. And welcome back to Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan. And if you just joined us, we've had on the line with us in the previous segments of the show, Robert Sly. And Robert is a wealth advisor, wealth management expert. Now, you know, I want to talk about financial advice. Uh, I'm working with a client right now, and I've encountered a very frustrating uh, situation with this particular client, and it is not the first time I've run into this, so I'm going to bring it up on the show and discuss it with you, my audience, and maybe there's a learning experience for all of you in the situation that happened with this particular client. So let me set the stage for you. This particular client came to me. The client uh, has been in business for quite some time has made profits over the years, but recently, uh, through a few hiccups in the business, uh, the business hasn't been that robust from a profit perspective. It's still making a little bit of money, but it's not making huge amounts. And the business itself does not have a lot of equity in the business. Uh, And what equity is in the business is pretty much secured at this point in time by 
uh, lenders of various sorts, uh, and the company is finding that it is constrained in its working capital, and it needs to take on new business. It's a project-oriented company, so they take on large projects. Some of these projects can be as much as a few million dollars. And very often the company has to front the costs for these projects. It's got to invest in labor and materials. It may get some deposits from its customers, but but typically the deposits are not enough to cover the money that's required. Now, the particular industry this customer is in right now is growing rapidly uh, due to the recovery of the economy and other things that are going on in the United States, particularly focus on infrastructure. There's a lot of business out there. And this particular owner of this company believes that he can significantly expand the business and take advantage of new opportunities. So we have been out seeing if we can assist him in raising some capital. And in fact, we have been able to uh, at least get a term sheet in place from a private equity lender uh, or a private lender. It's not a big bank. It's a, you know it's a private fund that lends to special situations, uh, and the uh, the owner of the business has gone all emotional about the fact that he's going to have to pay some fairly significant interest rates to put this credit facility in place and. Uh, I've received a number of emails from him and had discussions with him where he has described the lender as being vultures and predators and all other manner of emotional uh, kind of characteristics, if you will. And look at it, it, it the, the world of finance is not an emotional world. It is very simple. The people who put up money, whether it be equity or debt, or a combination thereof, are weighing the investment they make against the risk profile of the borrower. Uh, a borrower with a very low risk profile uh, and what would that be? That would be a company that makes lots of profits, has very little debt, and has lots of security. And it is a relatively low-risk industry. Okay, that is a low-risk profile. Well, that borrower is going to be able to borrow money at a much lower rate of interest than a high-risk company. So what would a high-risk company? A high-risk company would be a company that probably has uh, slim margins, uh, slim profits, uh, not a lot of uh, asset coverage for security in the company, and uh, the type of company whose business could be considered somewhat risky in that it, its fortunes could change fairly quickly. And by the way, that describes my client. It is a high-risk company. And uh, if you are running a high-risk company, you are going to be looking at paying much higher interest rates. It's not that the lenders are vultures or the lenders are predators. It's the fact that you are a riskier business. Your risk profile is greater than other companies. So take the emotion out of it. Nobody's trying to screw you. What they're trying to do is make a reasonable return on their dollars because they may very well lend to you and you pay them back, but there's going to be somebody else that they're going to lend to, another high-risk profile company, who is not going to pay them back or with whom they're going to have difficulty getting paid back. So they have to look at all of the companies in their portfolio and across the board, realizing some will succeed and some won't, balance that that return out. And to do so, they've got to charge some higher rates. It's not predatory. They're not vultures. They're not nasty people. And in fact, they're great people because they're out there providing capital to businesses that could not get this money from a traditional lender, such as a normal, regular bank, you know, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, uh, Chase, what have you. Or they could probably not get it from even perhaps a, 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 
a kind of a, a secondary lender, such as a factor or accounts receivable financier or perhaps a leasing company. Uh, so if you are a high-risk company, then what you are going to have to do is you are going to have to pay more in interest. So it's a real simple calculation. Does your business model support the interest that it's going to cost you or does it not support the interest that it's going to cost you? If you cannot increase your business, pay your expenses, pay the interest, and generate a profit, then it's a no-go. You don't take the money. It's not emotional. You don't call the guys vultures and nasty names. Your business model, it just doesn't work. And remember, business models are different. Margins are different. Profitability is different. So, uh, and the amount of cash that's needed to generate those revenues is different. So you've got to look at the financial model. You've got to build out a financial model. You plug in the interest rate on the amount of money you believe you have to borrow in order to generate the new business, and then you see if it works. If it doesn't work, you pass. If it doesn't work, then clearly your business model uh, it, it you know is is broken at, at least in terms of that kind of expansion if you need that capital. But if the only way you can expand your business and you're a high risk business is to get interest at at two percent or three percent, then your business model is broken. There's something wrong with it. So don't blame the vultures and the predators. Take the emotion out of it. It's a numbers issue. You run your spreadsheets. You run your financial projections. If you can pay the interest that is being charged by the lender on the amount of money you have to borrow to expand the business, it works. If you can't pay the interest, it doesn't work. Figure out a new strategy. Now, unfortunately, this particular individual uh, applied for an SBA loan. Now, mind you, he's been turned down for the SBA loan, but nevertheless, somebody told him that if he does, you know, has a, a, a couple of months of better profits or he's able to generate some more accounts receivable, he can go back to the SBA. And yeah, if you can get a loan from the SBA and you're only going to pay 5 or 6%, more power to you. But a lot of businesses can't. And, you know, really, uh, if if the only way you can sustain your business is to get basically a government subsidi subsidized loan, you really do want to be looking at your business model because you should be able to make enough money and enough profit with your business to pay market rates for interest. That's about it for the show today. You know, here at BizRap Radio, we believe we can fix the United States of America through a fundamental concept that individuals pursuing their own economic interests in free markets will create more prosperity for more people than can ever be achieved through government regulation and a planned economy. That's it for this week. I'm your host, Mike Manahan. Join me next week for another edition of BizRap Radio.